Hello everyone. Um, welcome back to our Food Agility CRC Research Seminar Series. We might just wait on just for a couple more minutes. Um, uh, we've opened just a bit early and um, uh, wait for some of the later comers to join us. So if you could just hang in for another minute or two. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our Food Agility CRC monthly online research seminar. It's good to have you with us. My name's David Lamb. For those of you that are new to our forum, I'm the Chief Scientist of the Food Agility Cooperative Research Centre and I'll be your MC for this seminar this afternoon. I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands and waters on which we all live and work. I'd also like to pay respect to elders of these lands and waters, both past, present and emerging. For those of you that are unfamiliar with our CRC, we're dedicated to unlocking the power of digital and data to transform our agri-food sector. And communications is actually right at the heart of that. It's more than just the fundamental research endeavor involving data and digital. But before I introduce our speaker, let's cover off on some housekeeping and some reminders for those of you that have joined us before. Firstly, the session is being recorded and ultimately we'll make this recording available to you. We do welcome questions and please use the Q&A tab, not the chat tab, to post your questions. The Q&A tab is located at the bottom of your screen. Whilst it's not possible for you to ask questions direct to the presenter yourself, um, at the end of the presentation, I'll be working through them live and we'll retail them to the presenter in a Q&A style. If there are way too many questions to cover during the Q&A session, which sometimes occurs, um, I'll select some representative ones to, to ask. And of course, um, if you do have a burning desire to follow up directly with the presenter at the end with some questions or clarification, um, please do so. And I'll mention that a little later on again. So we're in a world of fast media and even faster messaging, where the length of the knowledge value chain, that is the, the, the chain between the creator of knowledge and consumer is so much shorter now than it has ever been. We researchers have an obligation not only to comply with the age old necessarily robust process of subjecting our work to peer review, but also to engage directly with our stakeholders, communities and industry, for example, more directly. The conversation has revolutionized how we researchers engage. Sure, we've got a veritable golf bag of social media platforms, but if there's one thing we've learned over the recent past, that is the lines between fact and fiction can often be blurred. Moreover, social media has shown us that we can start with fiction and by the end of it, by the end of the communication process, many of our outside world colleagues accept it as fact. The conversation starts with fact and ends with fact, putting us researchers directly in touch with our readers. It offers informed, fast, fact-based commentary and debate on issues affecting our world. It's a website funded by universities that publishes analyses written by academics. In fact, you can't even write an article in collaboration with the conversation unless you are part of a research organization. So, how can we be a part of this amazing research? How can we contribute to it? And how can we derive value to it? And this is a topic of today's seminar. It's with great pleasure that I introduce to you our speaker, Sonny Craig. 
who's a senior editor with The Conversation. Sonny is an award-winning journalist and has been an editor of The Conversation since 2011. Sonny's previously worked as a political and general news correspondent in the Reuters Jakarta Bureau in Indonesia, and before that was at the Sydney Morning Herald. So with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce Sonny to deliver her presentation this afternoon. Over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David. And thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join this webinar today and learn a little bit more about the conversation, what it is we do, um, how to write for the conversation, how to pitch ideas to us, and um, what sorts of ideas we're looking for, and also what we're not looking for, just to give you a bit of a, a clearer steer on, um, on how to get your research showcased um, on an outlet like The Conversation. So I've got a presentation and I'm going to share my screen and go to that presentation. Um, I'm also quite happy to make this presentation available. Uh, so David's got a copy and um, anybody who would like a copy is very welcome to it. So I'll just go into presenting mode there. So um, David, I'm sure you'll let me know if you something goes wrong and you can't see my screen, but um, the first slide you should be seeing here is a, a black background, white writing saying pitching to the conversation. So um, uh, David uh, did a great job of describing what we what we did there. Basically, what, what we do, um, basically the conversation is a website. It publishes um, analysis written by academics edited by journalists. So it's a real collaboration between those two skill sets, um, your skill sets as researchers to really dig deep into really complex questions and come up with really interesting um, potential interventions and ideas, and our skills as journalists and editors to work with you uh, to make that message as clear as possible and to make your communication and your writing as clear as possible to an audience that by and large are not academics, you know, they're not experts in their field, they're interested in your ideas, but they don't necessarily speak your language. So, uh, like David, I also wanted to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on, on which we're meeting today. For me, that's Gadigal land. I'm in the inner west, um, Gadigal land of the Eora Nation. Also wanted to acknowledge any Indigenous researchers who've written for the conversation before who might be joining us today or perhaps are interested um, to write for us. Or maybe you may know of colleagues in um, research who are uh, keen to write for the conversation. We're very, very keen to hear from Indigenous researchers. It's an area that we're really trying to work on um, more than ever. Um, I'll just explain a little bit more about the conversation. So I, I described how, you know, the idea is that it's a, an independent source of news analysis and expert opinion written by academics working with professional journalists. The independent part comes from the fact that um, we don't take advertising, we're not uh, holding to a, beholden to a particular agenda. We are funded by universities. Every university in Australia funds us. Also, we get some funding from um, uh, CSIRO and others, uh, the Australian Science Media Centre as well. So that funding, and also a large component of our funding comes from readers. And we're actually currently doing a donation drive to um, source some more funding from readers. And what, what we do with that funding is hire editors to work with you guys as academics to get your message out about your research and your insights. But crucially, unlike other media, the academics who write for us get sign off on all the edits that we make. Um, and that means that when we're publishing something, it's something that you know you're comfortable with, you're happy to have your name on it. It's got a headline on it that you're um, okay with. You don't feel like it mischaracterizes your message or your ideas. And this is a level of control that I don't think you will get anywhere else in the media over the way that your work is presented. Certainly if you do an interview with a journalist, a reporter, and I know this because I was a reporter for many years, um, generally you will not get to see that piece of work before it's published. Um, you, if you write for another outlet, you edits may be made to your work and you may not get um, another chance to look at it until it's published. Often the person who writes the headline is a totally different person to the person you're liaising with as an editor in a newsroom, so you may not get control over the headline. That's not the case at the conversation. Academics get sign off on all edits, and it means that we can be really comfortable that there's no nasty surprises once we hit that publish button. 
So, you know, why bother writing for the conversation? Why bother doing that sort of outreach into beyond the world of um, academic journal publishing? So the idea is that you can get your ideas and your research findings out into the public in front of the eyeballs of um, the people who can do something useful with it, practitioners, key decision makers, and you can really extend the influence of your ideas and your research beyond the world of academia. Um, we can work with you on every single piece of work to help improve your writing skills. And those are writing skills and communication skills that you can use in other parts of your career. It doesn't hurt to become a better communicator in general. Um, and it is a much quicker turnaround usually than a journal article. So I know, I haven't been an academic myself, but I know from having worked at the conversation for the last 10 years that sometimes the time between you know your article being accepted for publication in a journal and it actually seeing the light of day can be a really long stretch of time that's not the case we can do things with, with the conversation we can do things in a really timely manner we can also work with you and with your journal that you're publishing an article in an academic journal paper to try and time your coverage at the same time so for example if you've got a new paper coming out in the journal of I'm just going to say the Journal of Sustainable Tourism because I've just edited an article that is about a paper that's appearing in the Journal of Sustainable Tourism. So we've done a piece for the conversation that this academic has done a really plain English, lovely, um, user-friendly, reader-friendly write-up of his findings and that will be published the same day that the embargo lifts on his journal article and we can hopefully use the conversation article to drive traffic back to his journal article and hopefully increase his impact, his citations and downloads. So uh, we also at the conversation provide each academic who writes for us with metrics that tell, give a bit of a clue and a bit of insight into, you know, how many people read my story? Where was it republished? I'll talk a little bit more about republishing in a minute. You know, uh, where were the readers? What parts of the world were they in? What were people saying on social media? How has my readership changed over time? So these are the kind of metrics that you can use to support your claim that you are making, I'm sure, over and over in your career about your impact and um, and your research. So you can uh, you can use that to support funding bids um, and provide evidence of impact beyond academia. And as I said before, you know these are writing skills that you can use in other parts of your career. So everything we publish on the conversation is free for other media to republish under a Creative Commons license. So it's quite common every day our work on the conversation is being republished by other outlets. So, you know, they could be outlets like, like every day the, the ABC is republishing at least one or two pieces, um, SBS, The Guardian, but also, you know, internationally it's, it's not that uncommon to get CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic. These are all republishers that we work with. So depending what your issue is, but if there is what the, the, you're writing about, you know, if it's a highly localised issue, obviously the chances of global republication start to diminish. But if it is a, an issue of some sort of global significance, then there's a good chance it'll get picked up internationally and that can really drive readership and drive impact internationally as well. So here's a little quote from one academic saying, in 24 hours, my piece on the conversation has had more views than all of my academic papers combined will ever have. So the conversation is really about reaching a really broad, large audience um, and creating impact that way. It's a very international audience. Um, we have a lot of readers outside of Australia and, and New Zealand. USA, India, UK and Canada are the top four countries of origins for our readers. And we can reach a very international audience. So all these little dots are, at, are places in the world where conversation editors are. So we have the Conversation Australia, that's who I work for, and that was the first conversation. But we also have the Conversation Africa, we have the Conversation Canada, the Conversation US, France, Spain, UK, so on and so forth. And a lot of those publish in more than one language. For example, Indonesia, they publish in, in um, Bahas Indonesia and also in uh, English. Um, Canada, they, they publish in French and in English, France, and so on and so forth. So your work may be translated and republished in those places and then picked up by media in those regions and republished there as well. And just to be clear, the funding for each of those conversation um, sort of offices around the world is locally 
uh, derived. So the conversation Australia, where I work, is funded by Australian universities, but in the US, it's obviously US universities funding that outlet. But I'm working all the time with my colleagues around the world to share stories and say, hey, here's a story about climate change, might be of interest to your readership. Here's a story about, um, you know, food security, um, food prices. So these are of global interest, um, you know, disease um, and all the also sorts of issues that we're sharing throughout the conversation network. So we're, we're reaching a very large audience. These are the numbers of users on site for the Conversation Australia um, through that republication. If you count up all of the reads that we're getting through, you know, the ABC, the Guardian and so on, then the number starts to get quite big. And then when you look globally, the number of readers throughout the Conversation Network that are on our websites is about 25 million a month. But globally, through republication, it's closer to 60 million. So these are, these are very big numbers. It means that even if I go to a party and I say to somebody, I work at The Conversation and they've never heard of it, they've never been to theconversation.com, they don't intend to go, I still, I know that they've read a Conversation article, they just don't realise it because they've read it in the ABC or they've read it in the SMH or um, somewhere else. So it's a, it's a large audience um, that we're reaching through republication. So just to go here, this is in a way the most crucial message of my entire presentation. If there is nothing else you remember from today but just this one thing, then I'm okay with that. When you write for the conversation, remember that 85% of our readers are not academics. Nearly 90% are not academics. A lot of people think that because we only publish academic researchers, that our readers must be academics as well, but that is not the case. It's almost like a translation service. You know, we are translating academic research to an audience of readers who, by and large, they're educated. Most of our readers, we know through our reader surveys, have an undergraduate degree or above. They're engaged in, um, you know, ideas, public debate. They, they probably watch the news, they read the news, they're engaged readers, but they don't necessarily work in your field, in your discipline. And they may not ever sit down and read a journal article or be familiar with the conventions of um, academic writing. So a lot of our readers work in government and policy. So we know there's a heck of a lot of readers, of uh, subscribers to our email lists that have email addresses that end in .gov.au. We have a lot in teaching, we have a lot in healthcare. So when you sit down to, the, to write for the conversation, don't imagine that you are writing for, you know, your favorite professor, your colleagues in the field, your, um, you know, somebody in your discipline that you're trying to impress. That is not your reader. Your reader is your neighbor, the nurse at, you know, at the local medical um, center, the um, teacher at your kid's school. Imagine you're writing for that person. What do you need to say to that person? What kind of language do you need to use for that person to succinctly describe the issue, the problem that you're trying to work towards um, helping to solve. What knowledge can you assume? Probably not a lot. And just remember that that reader is a very busy person, like all of us. They're, you know, they're, nobody's forced to read the conversation. Nobody's forced to read these kinds of stories that you're writing for us. So make it compelling for them. Make them understand why your issue matters and why they should read on and what it's got to do with their life. You know, why does this matter at all for them? So in terms of why write for the conversation, we know that when an academic makes time to write for the conversation, there's a high, it's more likely than not that they will be contacted by media after their story appears on the conversation by, you know, there's about a 70% chance that a journalist will call them and say, saw your piece on the conversation, can you write for my outlet? Can you come on my radio program? Can you come on my panel discussion? Or um, can you give me a quote from my story? I'd like to do a piece about your research. So use the conversation as a way to really snowball your public impact um, and using the media to get a big audience um, for your research and to show why your research really matters. We know that of the writers who write for us, about 10% are contacted by government saying, saw your piece on the conversation, we'd love to talk to you about um, some consulting work or some policy design or some ideas that we'd like to think about, um, you know, for a Senate inquiry or Royal Commission or some sort of um, government activity. Research, 20% uh, contacted for research collaboration or 
14% contacted for business collaboration. And sometimes these contacts come with funding. You know, sometimes it's a case of, you know, we're working on something, we've already got some funding for it, we'd like you to join with us. We also get academics invited to speak at conferences. Um, sadly of late, mostly via Zoom, but uh, hopefully that will change in the future. And it, certainly conversation articles tend to um, prompt a lot of discussion with colleagues in the public. So here are some examples of impact. Um, here's somebody from Curtin University who was writing about um, the topic of consent. You know, the piece was republished by the ABC. That led to a number of video and radio interviews, huge amount of um, follow-up interest from other media and then interviewed by a teacher magazine and Education HQ for a magazine article. Now that's a good outcome for her because she is interested in creating impact in classrooms, right? So she wants to be, she wants her research to be reaching the eyeballs of teachers. So, you know, this is sort of mass media communication. You don't know who's listening to the radio on, or reading these pieces, but this is much more targeted and, um, and that's a good outcome for her. Here's another one where somebody talked about um, teaching grammar, again, republished by other media, um, contacted by other media to say, hey, can you come and come on our show and talk about this issue? Here's another person talking about, um, I mean, in this case, a very niche little piece of Australian history um, and, you know, was in, uh, invited to um, public events and also to do um, some more interviews and invited to publish a paper in a journal based on her research. So she was very happy about that and that was a good outcome. Now I'm just thinking, all right. So I talked before about how each academic um, gets their own metrics, but each university also gets their own metrics, metrics and each university can get um, metrics on, you know, what their readership is like and how it's changing over time. And, uh, and you each get your own author dashboard, which shows your readership um, and how it's changing and where your readers are and a bit more detail about that. So I want to talk a little bit briefly now about what we're looking for, the types of stories we publish. So the number one thing that we're really keen on is new research. So if you have a journal article coming out in the future, I really do urge you to pitch to the conversation and I'll show you how in a minute and say, you know, hi, I've got a paper coming out in the journal of such and such, um, probably in the next, you know, month or two. Um, in that paper, you know, I talk about um, the findings from this study where we found X, Y, Z, this is interesting to your readers because it impacts their life or a policy decision in some way, um, in such and such way. Or they might say, you know, I've got a journal coming out, an article coming out where I make such and such argument and I'm arguing this particular, uh, prosecuting this particular argument. You know, I'd like to write a plain English piece for the conversation, 800 words or so, explaining my findings or my art article argument. And that plain English explainer that you write up with the conversation in collaboration with us as editors, we can get that ready and have it sitting on ice, ready to be published the day that the embargo lifts on your journal article and embed lots of lovely links in your conversation article, as I said before, driving traffic to your journal article. So it really does break my heart a little bit when academics contact me and say, you know, we did a study, really interesting. And I say, oh, wow, this sounds great. When did, when's the journal article coming out? And they say, oh, it came out six months ago. Because it's not really a new piece of research then. I mean, it may be new to you, but to our readership, um, which don't forget, forget is being bombarded with new news all of the time, the concept of what is new um, means basically it's coming out that day. Now, if your article came out six months ago, it doesn't mean you can't write about it for the conversation. We can find some other angle. We can find some other way to communicate those findings to our readers, but you wouldn't call it a new piece of research. So if you have a journal article in the works with the journal um, and it's with the publisher, please contact us ahead of publication so that we can get the article ready to go live the day the embargo lives on your journal article. Um, and by the way, this style of story where you're, find, you're talking about your findings for our readership, um, that gets really good republication rates. So the, the ABC is very interested in new research. Lots of other media are interested in new research. So really urge you to think about that one. 
The other category that we do um, is sort of a rapid analysis of issues in the news. So, okay, in this instance, this was at the time of the um, New Zealand election. We needed people to talk about campaigning techniques. Okay, great. These people have expertise in that topic. They can talk about it and use their expertise not to talk about their own research necessarily, not the, the paper that they're working on, but to use their expertise to contextualise and um, add some perspective around an issue that happens to be in the news at that moment. So don't forget, think of your reader. Your reader is, you know, as I said, the neighbour, the nurse, the, the teacher at the kids' school who is being bombarded with a new piece of news and wants to know, oh, what do the experts think about this? You know, is there something that you as an expert on this can add to contextualise this news and put it into some sort of perspective and help our readers understand it? Um, beyond just a headline. A third category of story that we publish is a sort of a timeless um, piece looking at, you know, a more um, long running question. So these ones, so I just want to say with this rapid analysis of issues in the news, we're often looking for very um, quick turnarounds for those sorts of pieces. Um, so, you know, for example, today, uh, you know, there's a COVID case in Victoria I don't know for sure if we will cover that. Um, I'm in Sydney, so, uh, you know, it might be different, but my colleagues in Victoria may decide to get somebody on, you know, an expert on um, epidemiology or infectious disease control to talk about, you know, what does it mean that now COVID's back in Victoria, even if it's just one case, what needs to happen now? You know, are we in a better position to tackle this? How might the response look different now to when it did, um, you know, six months ago or a year ago or whatever? So, that sort of story needs to really go live very, very quickly, probably the same day or the next day. It's a very quick turnaround. But these sorts of stories, you can have a much longer lead time. You know, you can, this is a piece saying um, tree ferns are older than dinosaurs. That's not even the most interesting thing about them. I mean, I happen to know this story is by um, Gregory Moore, a great uh, uh, guy who writes about botany and plants for us. I mean, he could have as long as he wants to write this. He can have months to write it if he wants to, but it's only about 800 words. He doesn't need months. But, you know, this is a, a piece about um, a piece of research. They had a lot of time to write it. This is a piece, uh, Curious Kids is a, a segment we do where um, children write in questions and we ask academics to answer them. You know, how does the sun help your body make vitamin D? No urgent deadline on this story. It could run any time the year and it would go great any time of the year. So when you th sit down to think about what can I write for the conversation, really ask yourself, what can I add? What do I know that nobody else, not nobody else knows, but that a lot of the readers don't know? Um, what, what can you, how can you use your expertise to help our readers better understand something that happens to be in the news? For example, it's federal budget day today. So Great day for experts on all sorts of different topics to chime in and talk about policies that are going to be in the budget and how and to use their expertise to help our readers understand, you know, what's the issue here? Why does it matter? What's the impact of this decision going to be? How is it going to change um, my life or um, the society in which I live? Okay. Another thing to do is if you work at a university um, who... Uh, just remember that we every day send out what we call the expert request to all the media and comms people at your university to say to those people, you know, we have just had our news conference. We're talking about such and such issue, which is in the news. I mean, obviously, this is not in the news at the moment, but this is that researcher you might be aware who was um, held in Iran for a very long time. It was released at the time. So, you know, we needed a quick turnaround piece reflecting on this topic of hostage diplomacy. And you know, we had a hunch there's somebody out there in the academic community in Australia who knows a bit about this topic. Um, and of course, there was and somebody from the media and comms team from one of the universities saw this contacted the academic put them in touch with us next thing you know, the story is underway and going live that day. Same here, you know, what, are, what do schools need to do to protect themselves from bushfires. Um, you know, if you have an expert at your university who knows about this topic or has a view on it or can use their expertise to inform um, our, our, our piece on this, um, we'd love to hear from them. So the reason I'm telling you about this is you have to ask yourself, does your media team know about you? Do they know your work? Do they have your mobile number? If they don't, you are making yourself very unfindable. So if your goal is to make yourself findable and, um, you know, please do contact your media team, let them know what are your topics uh, that you 
feel comfortable speaking on that you feel like you have some expertise on and give them your mobile number because when you're working with in the news cycle often the turnaround time is very very quick and we don't have time just to send an email and hope that somebody will see it that day okay so let's talk a little bit about pitching to the conversation if you go to our home page you will see there's this little spot it's actually sort of on the on the right hand side um, that says pitch an idea got an idea a news tip or an article idea for the conversation tell us you click on the tell us button the first thing that pops up is this is some wording that is trying to filter out people who are not academics so what do we mean by an academic some people say well i'm an academic because i have a phd well you may have a PhD, but if you no longer have a job title like PhD student, um, postdoc, lecturer, senior lecturer, um, professor, even adjunct professor is fine. Um, emeritus professor, honorary professor is fine. Um, but say somebody has done a PhD, I have no doubt that that person is an expert in their field. But if they're an expert that is now walk, working solely in the private sector or in consulting and has nothing to do with universities or research institutes anymore, then unfortunately the conversation is not the right outlet for you. I would urge that person to pitch to the ABC, The Guardian, another outlet. Um, I have no doubt that they have great ideas, but unfortunately it's just not for the conversation. So going back to the pitch page, you click that button, you go, yes, I'm an academic, I'm ready to submit a new pitch, and then you pitch. So what is a pitch? You know, you might have heard of the elevator pitch, right? It's where you're, the elevator's going up, you're in the room, in this tiny room with one person, you've got, you know, 30 seconds to get your idea across to them and say why it matters. So, you know, when you're pitching for the conversation, we, we want to know, what will your article say? We ask you to sum it up in one sentence, because if you can't sum it up in one sentence, you need to go away and do some thinking about what is it that you want to say? If you were to draft a headline on your article, what would that draft headline say? And we may not end up using that headline in the end. We may workshop something a bit, a bit different, but it's a good exercise. What would the headline be on my story? Why do our readers need to know about this? Why does this matter? Um, and what key points and examples, what evidence will you use to support your argument? So, you know, in one sentence, what will your article say? In terms of the why readers need to know about it, I just want to elaborate a bit on that. Just do not underestimate how explicit you need to be about why your, your take-home message that your 800-word article is going to get across matters. Why does that take-home message matter? And don't assume that our readers will necessarily join the dots instantly about why it matters. I'll give you an example. I had an academic writing for us a piece about childcare policy, childcare policy reform. Great piece, very well argued. They did this part great. It was had a strong argument that was really interesting. They did this part part great. It had some really interesting research to back up the main article, the main points of the article. Had excellent examples to bring the narrative to life and to even if hypothetical examples, excellent points that say, you know, take for example, Anne, not her real name. You know, she's back at work, but she's spending such and such amount on childcare. Blah 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 blah. So that was well argued, lots of examples, lots of evidence and a great take home message that was easy for my reader to understand and retain. What that author, who was an economist, who was an expert on childcare policy, had failed to do a bit was explain why does childcare policy matter to somebody who doesn't have a kid in daycare? I mean, I don't have a kid in daycare anymore, thank goodness, because it is very expensive, but most of my readers, chances are most of my readers do not have a child in daycare. So why does childcare policy matter to them? Now, that economist would say, well, clearly it matters because, you know, effective childcare policy is, you know, one of the greatest predictors about whether women return to work after having kids. It grows our workforce. Um, it, you know, um, grows our GDP. It reduces the brain drain that sometimes happens out of the workforce when people have kids. Um, you know, stimulates the economy because people have more money to spend. There's lots of reasons why effective childcare policy is important for the economy. He, as an expert, thinks that is blindingly obvious, but I have to say to him, that is not blindingly obvious. You need a line that points that out really clearly for my reader, because the first thing they'll think is childcare policy. Why do I care about that? Um, so you need to make it clear to them. So just when you sit down to pitch your story, ask yourself, why does my thing matter? And even if it's you feel you might feel like an idiot writing it you know you might be writing about food prices and you might say you might be like well 
drought drives up food prices. Now, you might, or floods, you know, wreck crops and that drives up food prices and that affects everybody. You might think that is stupidly obvious, but it is worth stating really clearly because my reader may not necessarily be thinking that when they're reading an article on the conversation really quickly. So as I said before, the idea is, you know, ask yourself, what's the story in a nutshell? What are your findings? Be clear about why the reader should care. Why now? Is something happened in the news that underlines the key point that you're trying to make or highlights a particular argument you'd like to um, prosecute? Or is there something that's going to happen in the news? Or is there an explainer that you'd like to write about an ongoing topic of general interest? You don't necessarily have to have a news hook. You know, we publish stories all the time that don't necessarily have a news hook, but um, just ask yourself if there is a news hook. Do I have a good examples to explain what I'm writing about? Why are you the person to write this? You know, if you tell me you're an economist and you're writing about, um, you know, wage growth or something or wage stagnation, don't say you're an economist, say you're a labour market economist because that's that's important knowledge for me. That, that signals to me as an editor assessing your pitch that, yes, this person really does know what they're talking about. Um, and don't assume that the person you're pitching to has a lot of time to go and read all your papers or your CV and understand really who you are and where you fit into the context of your discipline. So the idea is you pitch a story or we contact you. If accepted, you we agree on a brief and a word count. Usually it's about 800 words, not much, only really enough time to, to put forward maybe one main argument. Um, you write and file your draft. Then the editor that you're assigned will pick up your draft and find images, we'll format it, we'll edit it, we'll put a headline on it, we'll hand it back to you for checks and changes and you'll seek your approval. And really that's the moment for you to read it, you know, go through it with a fine tooth comb and, and ask yourself, what has she done? What has she done to my article? What errors has have been inserted in the editing process that I now need to weed out? And we really do rely on you to weed out errors that might be inserted when we rearrange the structure of a sentence thinking we're doing something really good, but we end up changing the meaning slightly. So it's your job to check it, make sure it's your something you're happy to have your name on. Once it's approved, we publish it, and then we try to get other media to republish it. So we use this sort of online collaborative editing software, which is just accessed via a browser, just by Chrome or Internet Explorer or something. It's got a little readability um, sort of widget here. If that's green, it means you are writing in a reading age of 16, which is what we are looking for. Our readers are not 16 years old. Mostly um, they have an undergraduate degree or above, so they're clearly not 16, but they're reading it on their phones. They've got notifications popping up all over the place, just like my phone is doing now. They're probably on a train or a bus or they're reading it quickly while they scoff some lunch. So they're not reading with their full attention. We're asking you to read, to write at a level that a 16 year old could understand because that is the reading level that a lot of our um, readers are reading with. When something is not green, as an editor, if I see it in the orange or the yeah or the red zone, it means you're not writing at a reading age of 16. The first thing I do is try to shorten the sentences. A short sentence is a really good sentence. It's a strong sentence. I watch out for acronyms. If somebody is talking about WTO, TRIPS, you know, um, I, I'm trying to think about that, ASIC, you know, the PC, that means Productivity Commission to um, economists, but to most people it means politically correct or a personal computer. So watch out for acronyms um, and watch out for really jargony language. You know, never, ever use a complex word where a simple word will do. I had an article where the author kept writing about exclosures, fences. We call them fences. We don't call them exclosures. You know, the idea is to not ask, um, you know, we don't want to write about the human male disembarked from the vehicle. No, a man got out of the car. That's the type of language that we're writing, uh, we're using when we write. Here's an example. I won't go through, because I'm running out of time in a lot of detail, but you can see quickly here, the first line is great, great impact. I understand what this author is going to talk about. But then the author goes too quickly into the weeds of blah, 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 science, science, science. I don't need to know that. Don't forget, as a reader, they're probably not a scientist and they probably don't have any scientific training. They just don't need to know this. This is much more important to my readers. This is the impact. This is the why it matters. Okay. So that's so just think about that when you're sitting down to write, that your reader is not in your field. 
just remember that we get far more pictures than we can publish. And so we have to be very choosy about it. Um, do use your pitch process. Try to avoid emailing editors directly because somebody might be on leave or might be away for some reason. They might miss your email. We are getting hundreds of emails every day. Okay, that's an exaggeration. I'm getting, I would say, scores of emails every day, lots and lots of press releases. So um, we just miss emails all the time. But if you use the standard pitch process that I explained before, we won't miss it. You should get a reply to your pitch within 72 hours. If you're writing about a news event, pitch as soon as possible. Don't wait a week because the news cycle will have moved on by then. Um, if it's tied to a journal article, try to let us know a rough publication date. Um, please don't give up if you get a no on your first go. That's very, very common. And the idea is that you might pitch three or four or five times and you might get a yes to one of them. And that's okay. That's a pretty good hit rate. Um, don't be discouraged. Okay, and do read before you pitch. So make sure you're reading our site. You don't have to read every single thing we publish every single day, but make sure you are getting a sense of what we're looking for. Um, what sort of stories do we publish and what sorts of language are we using in the articles? Um, and do a keyword search on the website before you pitch so you can be sure that you're not pitching something that we've already just published on just that day or a week ago. So if your pitch is accepted, do be responsive and make yourself available on the day of publication for media interviews, because remember those follow-up calls from journalists. If your pitch is rejected, please don't be disheartened. Try again. Maybe try again for a different time of year. You know, if you're writing about um, bushfire mitigation or something, you know, or, or bushfires, then obviously there's a certain time of year when everybody's interested in that topic. Or if you're writing about tax returns, there's a certain time of year when everybody's interested in that topic. And get some advice from your media team about how to hone your pitch. The media teams at universities usually are ex-journalists and they know um, what we're looking for. And I'll just let you know, we also have a masterclass that we run that's a paid class. So I'm doing a very short presentation today, but we've got a two-day um, session. Actually, it's really one day. It's two, two mornings, uh, one after the other, two half days, um, sessions where senior editors at the conversation offer individualized feedback on pitches um, for small groups. Contact the masterclass at theconversation.edu.au if you're more interested, and we can give you a quote on the pricing. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. So I will stop sharing there and um, throw to you, Dave. Thank you, Sonny. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a mod of questions to, to work through, uh, but also there's certainly room based on my, my experience of doing this to, to take more. So please keep your questions coming in. Sonny, um, I've got a few questions that are variations on a similar theme, but nonetheless, I'd like to ask each of them because they have a subtle difference yeah. between them, if I may. Yeah. And really it reflects the excitement of the audience about how to get involved. So, um, but the first one is about, First one, uh, quite often conversation articles are syndicated elsewhere. For example, you mentioned the ABC. When this happens, is the author's control over the article somewhat lost? Where does the, the control and the input go and stop in that process? Yep. I'll answer that question. It's a good question. We tell the republishers that they are not allowed to mess with the text of the article. So, you know, they're not allowed to rewrite a paragraph just because they have an opinion on how to do it differently or do it in their view better. They're not allowed to restructure it and so on. Um, we do give them some leeway to change the headline. So occasionally something will appear on the ABC and it'll have a different headline on it, but still a conversation article. Um, and if you go to the analysis and opinion page of the ABC and compare it with our homepage, you can, you can see them every day, which ones they are. Um, I would say we don't get flooded with complaints about that. Usually the ABC is pretty good um, about, you know, getting it right. Yeah, I've never had a, a problem with that. But certainly if that did happen to you and something was republished, a conversation article was republished by a different publisher and you felt that what they'd done with it was... Um, you know, you, something you weren't comfortable with, just call your editor or email your editor and we can reach out to them. You know, we, we have relationships with all of those republishers. We can say to them, look, the, the headline you've put on is inaccurate. You need to change it. And I can't imagine a situation where they would say, I refuse to. I mean, most of them would live in fear of um, doing something inaccurate anyway. So I, I would say just call us if that ever happened to you. Thanks, Sonny. Um, Sonny, in, in Australia, we do have a number of independent 
research organisations, think tanks if I could call them that. Um, many have, in fact, the ones I'm aware of, have very substantial sort of academic oversight review committees in terms of their operation and the material they put out. Um, is there a way that they can get accredited to be considered in the same light as, say, a university? Do you have a process or a precedence where that's been done? I mean, not really. To be honest, um, you know, the conversation's funded by academics um, largely. And I think, sorry, it's funded by universities, I should say. And uh, every university in Australia except one funds us. So every university except the University of Adelaide. Um, and when the University of Adelaide decided to not fund us anymore, we um, are no longer accepting pitches from the University of Adelaide. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's a part of the business model, really. But, you know, for example, I know somebody who, um, you know, is, uh, has an adjunct, like a lot of people have an adjunct position or um, some sort of position like that that allows them to write for the conversation. Um, you know, I know a researcher who's at the National Maritime Museum who, you know, that's his job. He's at the Maritime Museum, but he happens also to be an adjunct researcher, an adjunct professor at Newcastle University. Great. That'll do. You, you can write for the conversation now. So, yes, that is the answer. Thank you. No, thank you. And in fact, it leads on to the next one that uh, universities aim to all universities, I guess. So, for example, we have a question here from someone that has done does work for an overseas university. But again, I'm reading here that at the end of the day, if that person who's working for an offshore institution, as reputable as it may be, if they have an affiliation with an Australian university, an Australian Well, hang on, let me just answer that question. So it depends, like, it depends on where the university is. So it's very few places in the world. If you're with a university anywhere, you can write for the conversation. It's really just a question of which conversation. So say, for example, um, you know, somebody wanted, so I, I knew an Australian researcher who was doing research about um, women in Kenya, right? But they happen to be based, I think, in Armadale or something like that. Now, to be honest, the readership that is most interested in that is the Conversation Africa. So I put that person in touch with my colleagues in the Conversation Africa. They said, yes, please, we would love a story about your research. Our readership would be really interested in that. And it was republished there. So, you know, if you if you're working for a university in, I don't know, the, the Pacific or um, you know, Japan, we would probably publish that. Um, or if it was close, like if somebody's in um, where's a sort of no man's land. So say it's the say they work in Malaysia, right? We don't have a conversation office in Malaysia, but we do have one in Indonesia. So the Indonesian office might process that article, or we might do it if it was something of global significance or interest. Um, does somebody says, oh, yes. Oh, sorry, you, I'll let you read the questions out. Or oh, do you want me to read them? Because I can see them and I can just go through them really quickly. Uh, sure, go for it if you like. Okay, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, is there a role for retired academics to write for the conversation? Maybe. Are you an honorary? If yes, then yes, you can write for the conversation. But if not, then not really. Um, so you have to have some sort of ongoing position. Joe says, I'm a comms person. I'd like to encourage my people to pitch. Are you okay with me helping them? Oh, my goodness, yes. We love the comms people to do that. That is brilliant. Um, and feel free to contact me if you want help on doing that or if you want to use the presentation to do that. Does a PhD candidate qualify? qualify? Yes, we have PhD candidates writing for us all the time. And often PhD candidates happen to be the national expert on one particular question because they're the only person writing about that. Somebody says, where do we get the pitch form? I think that's a good question. What I might just do is show you um, on our website. Do you mind if I screen share again, David? Okay, I'm gonna go back to screen share. Okay, so here we are in Chrome, go to the conversation website. So it's there and um, you can see, here's our front page at the moment. We've got some stories about this. We've got some stories about that. Some COVID stories go down, 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 down. Oh. Donate today, feel free. Um, down, down, down. Here we go to pitch an idea. Now, if you can't find it, just do a control F and you'll find the word pitch. You click on that and here comes that page that shows, this is again, filtering out the people who are not academics. Yes, I'm ready to pitch. Okay, here's where you write down your pitch. You say which section you want it to go on. Um, please include your mobile number because we can't, um, you know, we can't publish it unless we get you to approve it or you or you click that approve button. So, you know, if you disappear and we can't contact you, then the story just kind of dies at that point. 
So yeah, that's where the pitch is. I will also just um, drop into the chat section the URL for that pitch. Um, okay, so I don't know, where can I put it? Let's say I'll put it over here in the chat. Oh, can I put it in the chat? Okay, yeah, here we go. Here we go. All right. So going back to the Q&A, where do we get the pitch form? I've already answered that. David, supposing your article is accepted and published in the Guardian, ABC or SBS first. Oh, right. When you say article, you mean like a journal article, right? Oh, okay. Let me, let me say something. And if this is not the answer, I will try to um, re-answer it. But David Milne, say you've written a journal article and then you've contacted the you know, science editor at the ABC, um, which is, I think, Mikey Slazak, great journalist. And he said, yeah, that sounds great. I would love to do a piece about it with you. Um, and then subsequently later you um, publish, you contact the conversation. We would not republish the same piece of work. Or say you wrote an opinion piece or not an opinion piece, but like an analysis piece for The Guardian about a particular policy. Um, and then later on, you wanted to have the same piece of work republished in the conversation. We would not republish it. However, you can do contact lots of different media and have slightly different articles about the same body of research. And you see this all the time. You know, often there's one piece of research that everybody's talking about that day. Yesterday, I think it was the research on vaccine hesitancy. Um, you know, there was a piece on the SMH, there was a piece on the ABC. Um, everyone had done their own sort of piece about these research findings, but they were not word for word the same article. They were slightly different pieces of coverage about the same research findings. So that's fine. Um, okay. All right, Rob says, my impression is many authors are writing commentary to, to push particular barrows. Uh, why does the conversation allow this? Why, what do you do to try to prevent it? Uh, the answer is we don't try to prevent it. It depends on what it is. For example, we have a very active arts and culture section and in arts and culture research, your ability to prosecute an argument really convincingly in the humanities, that may well be your expertise. Like that is sort of the heart of research. Or if you're doing a review, um, of a piece of um, theatre or something, then, you know, it's okay to have a barrow to push. Say you are a climate scientist and you want to talk about your findings and you want to talk about why you believe action on climate change is urgently needed. Um, we would say that's, that's okay. That's you using your expertise to produce an informed opinion. What I wouldn't really look for is something that is just what I would call purely opinion and that has nothing to do with your expertise. So if you are, um, you want to write a piece about why you think that the GST should be increased to 15%, but your expertise is on art history, then that's not a piece for the conversation. You know, that's not, you're not using your expertise to um, inform the debate. But if you're an economist and you want to write, write about as many economists do, you think that um, uh, stamp duty is a dumb tax. Uh, I, I would accept that article. Or if you want to write a piece, why are you thinking? Why you think it's a good tax? You know, I would also accept that piece. In fact, I'd very be very interested in that piece because you can find very few economists who love stamp duty. Um, so you know, there is an art to weaving opinion and um, and informed expertise together. Sometimes, quite often, we will have a piece that is really stripped of opinion. For example, we have authors who write for us who work for the Bureau of Meteorology, who work for CSIRO, where it is really their job to not push a particular barrow. It is not something that they are allowed to do. It's not something that they want to be doing. It is not, um, it's not in their job description in any way. And that's fine. So if a, if a Bureau of Meteorology person wants to write for us about a particular you know, explainer about what is a La Nina or something, you know, I don't expect them to have a whole section in there on how, you know, weather patterns are being affected by climate change. And that's why we need a carbon tax now. And I certainly wouldn't be pushing them to do that because I know that that is not what this piece is doing. You know, it is a straight explainer on a piece of science, stripped of opinion. That's not what the article is about. So it, the answer is it depends. Okay, um, what about an academic libra librarian writing about something involved with university libraries? Mm. When we say you have to work for a university, we say you, we mean you have to be academic staff. Now, we 
I have had pieces about academic libraries before on the conversation, but by and large, they're by researchers who are researching topics such as, um, you know, like uh, journal, the, the, you know, the system of the journal articles and, you know, the, the, the power of companies like Wiley and Elsevier and so on. Um, it's not really the librarian themselves. Sometimes you might, we have to, um, split hairs on you know is somebody employed as academic staff or professional staff professional staff like if somebody for example is in the IT department at a university and wants to write about hacks on university um, you know in, uh, computer uh, infrastructure you know they are very well versed in that topic they know a lot about it nobody is questioning their expertise but they can't write about it for the conversation they'll have to write about it for someone else because um, they're not academic staff they're not researchers but if they were a researcher researching that field, then yes, they can write for the conversation. Cassandra says, as long as one author is affiliated with an Australian university, is it possible to include a co-author that doesn't meet that criteria? Maybe, maybe. It really depends. We don't love it, but sometimes we'll let you get away with it. For example, I published a piece recently by a researcher at University of Sydney who called Michelle Villeneuve, whose whole research thing is about how disasters are experienced by people with disability and what we can do to ensure they're not left behind, right? Now, in all of her community consultation that she does working with people with disability to find out their experiences of disasters, you know, she works with peak organisations. And she said, if I write this article for you, I need to have somebody from one of these um, peak organisations listed as a co-author we would list them in italics at the bottom of the article saying so-and-so contributed to this article, you know, Helen Brown con contributed to this, uh, from such and such organisation contributed to this article. But um, we don't tend to do that much. Are there any themes, areas that the Conversation AU is interested in publishing at the moment? I mean, yes, sure, but it changes week to week. So today it's all about the budget. Um, what else is it about? You know, I mean, some topics never really go away. Always interested in COVID, always interested in um, climate change, uh, you know, economic reform, the state of the Australian economy, you know, all that sort of stuff. Just read the news. Have a look in the news. If you can scan the front page of the paper or the front page of a, a news website, you'll get a sense every day of what the kind of big news stories of the day are. Um, and uh, or what sort of themes are developing in your field like you might start realizing that hey suddenly people are paying attention to a certain issue um, then that could be a good a good time to pitch uh, okay somebody says if you're worried about your area of science has had cuts despite um, investment is the conversation the place to air and rationalize that concern it depends Sometimes, not, I wouldn't rush at it, but for example, sometimes there's a place for it. For example, you know, as you all probably know from experiencing this, a lot of research um, funding in science has been thrown into um, COVID and um, particularly last year, there was so much money being thrown into vaccine research i mean for a good reason not nobody's saying that's not a, a good thing to do but you know i knew somebody who's who wanted to write a piece about why basic science still needs to be funded so you know we still need to fund science degrees we still need to have a lot of those kind of science underpinnings if you want to get the more um, focused research then you need to fund the basic science as well so yes um we might do that sort of piece it it depends we would have to assess on a case-by-case -case basis Cybersecurity, is the conversation interested in this topic? Yes, very interested. One of the big stories that is not going away and increasingly will just become a bigger and bigger story. The trick is really trying to write about it in a way that every reader can understand, you know, forgetting that, remembering that most readers would not even know what two-factor authentication is, much less know what 2FA stands for. So remembering that you're writing for a reader who probably uses the same password for every single thing. So, you know, if you want to talk about high-level security stuff, um, that's fine, that's important, but you need to break it down in a way that my reader can understand and can see the consequences of not addressing those issues um, properly. All right, I'm at 2.58, so I probably should stop. What do you think, Dave? Thank you, Sonny. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. I do have one in chat, but a quick one, Sonny. 
Is there any room for diagrams or pictorial representation? Yes. Yes. So we do have. Um, uh, so sometimes people create their own. I mean, it depends on what you mean by diagram, right? We love charts. We will probably recreate the charts for you in Data Wrapper so that they're in the conversation colors and style. And stylistically, it just looks nice on the website and doesn't mean that we're using lots of different fonts all over every different article. Um, we always love pictures, video. If you're out in the field and you're researching the impacts of drought and you have amazing video or photos on your phone, please tell us because that will go great on social media. If you know if you're writing about coral bleaching and you know and you have video of it, like we, we would love to see it. Um, if you have diagrams, or charts that tell the story in a more compelling way that words could, like it's a line chart that shows a really clear trend, we would love to hear about it. So don't, um, don't be shy to tell us about visual ways to tell the story that, that go beyond just bunches of words. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Sonny. Uh, look, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Sonny, you've got a fan base. Like the questions are flowing in and so are the chat. So um, look, thank you for a wonderful presentation. No worries. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you do want to reach out to Sonny or the conversation, there's a link that we shared earlier. And of course, there's a link that we put up about the pitch um, that Sonny sent to us as well. Don't forget, we'll be releasing the recorded version of the seminar in the next couple of days. Um, and our next research seminar, which will be coming up next month, is uh, looking at some of the amazing agrometeorological data resources around us and how we can use them in our modelling. So look, thanks again, Sonny. Thank you all for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.